Bless the Lord. We serve an awesome God. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will clap our hands, lift our hands, open up our mouths, and rejoice glory, and be glad in it. Hallelujah. Father God, we glorify you, and we honor you, we praise you, we magnify you. You're so worthy of all the worship. Come on, put your hands on it right here. of triumph. Yes, God. We love you. We glorify you. We honor you. We bless you with our hands lifted. God, we want your presence more than anything. Whew. And so we ask that you feel this place.
Come on, he's worthy of all the praise and all the glory. I want you to buy somebody around you, at least two or three people. Give them a fist bump, hug, high five. You know how we do it. Let's share some love all over this place. Come on, come on. seated in the presence of the Lord today. We greet you in divine love. We thank God for you today. And of course, we welcome you, all of you watching around the world. Help me thank God for those watching around the world right now. Mouths out anywhere. We appreciate you so much. We don't take it for granted. If you are sharing with us for the first time today, we just want to welcome you. We thank God for your presence today. Um, you're a very, very special guest of ours today. And if it's your first time, we want to put something in your hand just about our church. And uh, if you're just the first time person here sharing today, if you don't mind just standing really quickly, not to say anything, but it's just our way of thanking God for your presence today. If there's anybody here for the first time, Mount Zion, help me thank God for those who are here for the first time. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. We appreciate you so very, very much. We're grateful to God. Thankful to have one of my spiritual sons here today, Alan T. Russ. He's the pastor of the Gilfield Missionary Baptist Church and there in Kentucky. We thank God for him today. Let's thank God for him. Amen. 
we're so excited, of course, uh, uh, next Wednesday. It's going to be off the chain in here. I want to encourage you to get here around this time. Get here early because next Wednesday um, we'll have one service, and it is our Black History program, and we're excited about it. Dr. Michael Eric Dyson will be with us. Also, we are excited about our uh, Black History presentation. Our young people have worked so very hard. Our music and worship arts team have worked so hard. Our theater ministry. It's just going to be a great, great, great production. And it's just important for us to take a moment and celebrate our history and to uh, be challenged and empowered. It's just going to be a great night. And we're going to bless five businesses. We're going to bless them financially. We're going to have this great raffle. It's going to be awesome. And you're going to have over 250 business owners to put their business cards in for this. So you you know it's going to be powerful, and we're excited about that. We thank God for you, so make sure you're here, and uh, and uh, we thank God for our um, our new T-shirts we have out there. Hope you get one; uh, it will be a blessing. I am changed T-shirts who are in the bookstore. Get one, get one, get one. We're wearing them next week, but if you don't have one, still come. You can still come. Don't say I don't have a T-shirt, so I didn't come. Don't do that. Come. It's important. We just want you to be a part of what God is doing. So excited about what God's going to do this weekend as we'll be in part four of this series. Y'all being blessed by the deeper series on Sunday. I'm telling you, God is God is using that series all around the world. I'm getting so many, so much feedback around the world from it. And I'm just grateful to God for how he's using this uh, technology to bless so many people everywhere. Hope you stay connected with us on social media. Joseph Walker 3, myself, Dr. Steph at Dr. Steph Walker, and of course Mount Zion uh, at MT Zion Nashville. Follow us on social media. We'd love to stay connected with you. Amen. We're going to prepare our hearts to worship God now in our giving today. I know there are blessed people of God in the house today. We're the blessed saints of God. We're going to prepare our hearts right now. Of course, let's do that. And of course, we thank God for you today. And uh, if you want to give by text, that information is on the screen. Let's give liberty to God. We're just grateful. We know what it means to sow seed in good ground. Father, thank you for the privilege we have to give. Bless every household, every family. And we thank you that it's already done. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. I pray your word will speak to us, let our faith be strengthened, and we thank you for the fact that our relationships will be better. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight, we're going into part three of this teaching on relationships, and tonight I want to focus on relationship alignment and what kind of people we should have in our lives. Um, our opening scripture, just as a foundation, will be Proverbs 27 and 17, where the Bible says that... Iron sharpens iron, and a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Relationships matter to God. They should matter to us. But more importantly, what it means to be in alignment with God really determines the health of our relationships with other people. You cannot be in an unhealthy relationship with God and expect to be in a healthy relationship with people. So the principal thing 
is to make certain that you are in a vertical alignment, healthy relationship with God before you attempt to engage the lives of other people. We're going to learn a lot about that tonight. But what is important to understand is that God wants us to be in healthy relationships. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter what you've attained in life. If there is no health in your relationship, nothing really matters, right? Because there's no joy in that. Uh, it is said that a poor man with a loving family and good friends is far richer than a man who is poor relationally. So it isn't about how much money we accumulate. It isn't about how much fame we have. It's about the strength of our relationship so we don't die alone. Um, so that you don't end up with a crowd of people around you and still be alone. You can't make an assumption that just because people have people around them that those are healthy relationships. Those are really social props. Mm -hmm. they're, 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 they're selfies that are not necessarily substantial and significant relationships. I want you to hear something. A Jewish teacher asked Jesus, which is the greatest commandment? Jesus' response in Matthew 22, 37 through 40 is of note. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, and your mind. And this is the first and the great commandment. The second is alike. It's just like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Of these two commandments hang all the laws of the prophets. All the law and all the prophets, meaning that everything that God's word says hinges upon the health of two relationships, your relationship with him and your relationship with other people. Matter of fact, you can't, you know, you can't receive the blessing of the Lord without being in relationship with him. If my people who are called by my name along with themselves, all that, that's a healthy relationship with God, right? But you can't hate people and expect God to bless you. So I've got to make certain I understand at the foundational level what it means to be in right standing with God so that I can be in right standing with people. And then when you evaluate your life, some people really do have to question themselves about the kind of people they attract. Because what I want you to understand tonight is that you attract what you are. <laughs> now, that may be a surprise to some of you because you're like, I'm not like those people. Yeah, 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 yeah. You are. You ultimately are attracting what you are. Let me give you an example. I've used this example before, but I'll use it again for the benefit of those of you who may be here for the first time. Never heard it. There's a conference. A hundred people show up. No, a thousand people show up. You're in a remote area of Colorado. It's a thousand. You're on this conference for your job. And you smoke weed. And ain't but one other person in the whole conference smoke weed. How y'all find each other? <laughs> Out of all them people, y'all done found each other. Y'all look like, man, I'm so glad somebody here got some stuff because you feel me. Because you attract what you are. That magnetic pull you feel toward people is probably because what's in you is in them. Get it? So, so it's important to understand this. That's why it's important as a new believer in Christ to, to check that, right? Colossians 3 and 12 tells us that as the elect of God and holy and beloved put on tender mercies and kindness and humility and meekness and long suffering so that we have this kind of spiritual affect that attracts the positive, positive things we desire because you can't expect Expect something that you don't have the discipline to create within yourself. Hmm? Like this scripture Solomon says in Proverbs 18 and 14, which 24 rather, which is, you know, a man who has friends must himself be friendly. As a friend that stick it closer than a brother. You can't be mean talking about I ain't got no friend. There's a reason why you don't have no friends because you're not friendly. And if people, let me just, if people tell you you're not friendly, believe it. You don't get to choose if you're friendly or not. 
the beneficiaries of your, re of your life choose whether or not you're friendly. I ain't no me. Yeah, you, you, you're not friendly. Right? Right, so, so, so think about it. It's important that I, I cannot expect from people what I don't have the discipline to create within myself. So I got to self-check. Now, part of that self-check is, before I move into a relationship with other people, let me, let me self-check what I have in God, the alignment I have in God, which is, what does that produce? Now, this is where the health of you begin. You have right perspective. Perspective says that I look at my reality the way God looks at it. Now, why am I sharing this with you? I'll show you. When I go through trouble, I don't view it negatively. I view it as God's hand is moving in my life. And when I'm down to nothing, God is up to something. And I would believe truly what Isaiah 55 and 8 declares. His thoughts are not my thoughts. His ways are not my ways. So I view my life like God views it. I believe what 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18, and I'll just focus on verse 18. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, the things which are not seen are eternal. I don't look at life like everybody else. I look at life through God's lens. Therefore, I don't approach relationships the way other people do. I don't levy, levy expectations on people that never were intended to be. I look at my reality the way God looks at it. Therefore, that makes me not a vulnerable person. So you ain't going to catch me slipping just because I'm going through a tough time. Because I'm like, no, God is working. I'm cool. You all right? You No, I'm God. God's working. I'm cool. Right? You need me to pray for you? You mean P-R-E-Y or P-R-A-Y? Because <laughs> God is working. See, because I understand this. It gives me right perspective, but it's also protection because I'm covered by this relationship. See, because, because God commissions himself to take care of me. I am God's child, and God has a variety of ways in which he does this. God takes care of me in so many different ways. I have to be willing to accept and experience all the ways. Sometimes even when life rains on me, I have to view that as a blessing because the rain, though we demonize rain, 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 go away, come back another day, rain for the farmer is a blessing because he's got seed in the ground. So when, when God blesses me, I say, God, any way you want to bless me is all right with me. I've learned to see blessings in stuff other folk complaining about. I've learned to see blessings in closed doors. God provides me by closing that door. While you power, and I'm thinking, Lord, you close that door because you got like a whole slew of doors over here. So, so when God does that, I, I, I'm reminded of Philippians 4.19, and my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. Somebody just shout, God takes good care of me. See, when God takes care of you, you don't go through life needy and thirsty. You, you don't sign up for situations depend, ask, asking somebody to take care of you. When you're a child of God, you know God take care of you. So you ain't tripping because somebody somebody, if I leave you, uh, how are you going to make it? First of all, I was making it before you got here. Because the God I serve get me started. Don't I sound like you? Don't I sound like you? <laughs> it's how like you get gassed up. You know you get gassed up like that. First of all. Matthew 6, man. Matthew 6, 31. Are you worried? What you shall eat? What you shall drink? What you shall wear? That's what the Gentiles seek. Your heavenly father knows you have need of these things. What you do is understand relational alignment. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. So stop worrying about tomorrow. You got enough stuff to deal with today. God gonna take good care of you. Every single time, God's got you. Isn't that a blessing knowing that? If I'm in a relationship with and I'm like, I'm not worrying about how I'm going to get this paid or how that's going to work out. God's got me. Here's the third thing. I have peace. Now, <laughs> this big. In Romans 12 and 18, if it's possible, as much as it depends, live peaceably with all men. Let your priority be to live peaceably among people. What I have discovered People who do not live peaceably among people don't have personal peace. See, I, I, I'm, I, you know, I, I study, many of you have been following my podcast, I hope you have, 
And I talk about, in the last show, I think I talked about EQ, emotional quotient, and I study that stuff, and I, I'm always interested in, in how people are. You know, people aren't the way they are, just the way they are. That's, that's the emotional EQ thing going on. But also, I, I discovered that a lot of times when people bring chaos in my life, it's because they have chaos. And it has nothing to do with you. That's why you have to ask God, Lord, let me make certain I get all the unreconciled issues out of my life before I engage other people because I'm going to transfer that dissonance into their life. And I, I, I love music. Many of you may don't know, I play, I play the piano and drums and whatever I get my hand on, I just like music. And if you know anything about music, those white keys, major keys, yeah, yeah, you hear that? It's major chords. Probably C, E, G, you know, it's major chords. That's harmony. It's beautiful. You introduce one of those black keys to that card, it's dissonance. Hear that? Dissonance. You go back to major, peace. You introduce that one other note, it creates a sense of suspicion, anticipation, anxious. That's what happens. Like, Major card. We all having a good time. We playing cards. Everything's fine. Then that person show up. <laughs> Changes the whole room. Come on. Talk to me. Who am I talking to? Like everything was cool, but when that person walked in, everybody was like, That's how dissonance works. Because something's not at ease. Something's not at ease, right? And I could run that a whole lot of ways for me spiritually. It's kind of root of jazz, right? It's kind of making music out of that which is not at ease, right? But the whole point of that is the idea is for you to realize that as long as you are at peace with yourself, you bring harmony in the lives of other people. But if you ain't at peace, your relationships will never be healthy because all eight of them can't be wrong about you. <laughs> hmm. Now, there are three reasons or three ways people come in your life. Three kind of people. People that come for a reason. Let's be very clear. A reason. Some people come in your life just for a specific reason. To mentor you, help you get to another level. And it's okay. Once that reason is accomplished, they either... Leave or they stay. But you have to know that some people come into your life through relationships for specific reasons. Reasons. Once the reason is accomplished, you have to be willing, if it's time to let it go, let it go. Space shuttle, when it took off from Cape Canaveral, it had two rocket boosters that served a purpose. They were on there for a reason. Once the space shuttle got to a certain altitude, the two rocket boosters fell off. They weren't malfunctioning. They served their purpose to get the space shuttle to a certain altitude, but they were not meant to go into the orbit. If they were to stay on beyond the reason that they were created, the space shuttle would crash because of too much drag. Let people serve their reason in your life and be okay if. Why oh, you ain't calling me? Why is it up? Because they serve their reason. It's okay. But also people come in your life for a season. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, Three and one, everything has a season, a time for everything under heaven. So some people come in your life, it's seasonal. And it's really okay. There are certain seasons in your life you need certain people at certain times. Some people come in your life to mentor you, to help you, strengthen you, pour in your life for that particular season. And you got to know that when the season is up, it's up. Watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. This is, watch this, watch this. How, who in here today? Let me show you something. 
Let me show I, 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 This is like a, a psychosis of a dysfunctional pattern of relationships. Watch, I'm going to study. I'm going to do a case study on some of y'all. How many of you today, when you know on the milk cart it says expired, you still think the milk got a few more days? <laughs> Look at I knew you were here. I grew up poor. I know that feeling. And mom be like, drink that milk. Ain't nothing wrong with that milk. It's got two more days on it. Like, oh, that milk. Oh. Ain't nothing wrong with that milk. Listen to me. Doggone it. It is expired for a reason. Because if you drink something that's expired, what the manufacturer is saying is that you take on the risk and I am responsible for the results. When God tells you that a relationship has expired, when you choose to continue on, you take on the risk. And I don't care how you come down here to the altar, my Lord, fix it. You took on the risk. I'm going to drink this milk. Keep on drinking it here. <laughs> a lifetime. Some of you becoming your life for a lifetime. These are amazing relationships God sent. You get one of these, boy, let me tell you something. It's amazing. When somebody come in your life like this, God sent them. How do you know these people? Because these are people that come in your life for purposes greater than you. It's something God wants you to accomplish by y'all being together. It's not always male, female. It could be your best dude. It could be your girlfriend. It could be, it's like a lifetime. Like we, we ride or die, ride or live. It's like, it's like you can miss this kind of relationship because you think because you go through a tough spot. We fell out for a few months and we ain't talking. You think that's why you for a reason. That's why you for a seat. No. You're going to fall out with people like that. But you're going to always come back. You're going to always come back. You're going to have a cookie and what's his name? Lucius relationship. <laughs> All that, you come back. Y'all be, be in this for life, yeah? <laughs> because the issue, the issue, my point is that even in these relationships, they don't always have to be, you know, romantic. We think because somebody in my life for a lifetime, maybe it's meant to be more. No, sometimes people in your life, they're pouring to you, they understand you, they guide you, they help you. Some of your closest friends, man, they've been rolling with you for a long time. But I like, mean, I've been with you since we were like in junior high school. Some folk you meet in school, and y'all be lifelong friends. You be like, man, we in this thing for a lifetime. You just never know how God arranges these relationships. And when you have them, you have to cherish them. You have to know that these are sent, but they often are for purposes greater than your own personal benefit. It's for something much greater that God wants to accomplish. So there's some biblical examples of relationships, right? I'll give you a couple. Elijah and Elisha. Elijah and Elisha is a powerful relationship of two men. One is the mentor, one is the mentee. Elijah is the mentor. Elisha is the mentee. Elijah is trying to get his mentee to stay. Like, I got to go, so I want you to stay right here till I get back. Something interesting occurs in 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 2 through 6. Elijah said to Elijah, stay here, please, at the Lord. The Lord is sending me on to Bethel. But Elisha, the mentee, said, I ain't going nowhere the Lord. The Lord lives and your soul lives. Man, I'm not going to leave you. That's the key word. I am not leaving you. Hmm. So he went down to Bethel. Then the prophets, the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came and told the mentee, Elisha, you do know the Lord is going to take him away from you, right? He said, yeah, I know. Keep silent. I like that. So you need somebody in your life that can tell people, shut up. I know already, but I'm still going to be with them. <laughs> Not like, for real? Shoot, how you know that? <laughs> and, and then Elijah said to him, man, stay here. I'm going to Jericho now. Same thing. The Lord lives. I'm not going to leave you. They came to Jericho, and then here come the sons of the prophets again. You do know. Lord, I'm going to take him. 
Yeah, I know. Be quiet. I already know. Then he comes again and says, look, man, listen, listen, stay right here. I'm going to go to Jordan. And uh, as the Lord lives, I'm not going to leave you. You need somebody in your life that says, I'm going to stay with you no matter what. No matter how uncertain it's going to be, I'm going to walk with you through this no matter what. That's a real friend, man. Let me show you something. David and Jonathan, perhaps one of the most powerful friendships in the whole Bible. This one, I break down to you. It's a friendship that happened in such a way, man, like, I, I, I ain't never seen nothing like this before. You got David, who was the servant to King Saul. Think about this one. Saul been trying to kill David because David, he's jealous of David. And the women sang their songs for Saul, but they really sang their songs for David. And Saul gets jealous, but David just loved Saul. He had a chance to kill him and didn't kill him. Like, I can't kill you. See, I love you. I'm faithful to you. And Saul was still jealous and tried to kill the brother, but he kept serving him. Saul got a son named Jonathan, Saul the king. By right, because of the patriarchal bloodline, Saul's son, Jonathan, should be next king. Jonathan comes to David like, bruh, you've been serving my daddy. I know my daddy crazy. You've been serving my daddy, playing music when he got depressed. God already showed me that you're going to be the king. And he showed my daddy, no, he don't like you. So when you become king, no, I got you. I'm going to serve you faithfully. I'm going to be right here. You need a friend in your life who can accept the second seat when everybody else thought they should have been first. Somebody that can support you when they felt like, you know what, this is the hand of God on your life and I'd rather see you get it than me just walk into it because I feel like I'm entitled to it. I said over and over again, your real friends are those who can celebrate your happiness whether it involves them or not. If all the people in your life got a benefit from your happiness, those aren't your friends. People that can say, I'm proud, I'm happy for you. I want to see it manifest in your life. He loved them so much. In 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 26, he said, I'm distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. You have been very pleasant to me. Your love for me was wonderful, surpassing the love of a woman. That's how deep they loved each other. It was powerful. I'll come back to Paul and Silas in a moment, but let me talk about this. Here are the seven kind of people that benefit your life. Here are the folk I want you to have in your life right here, right? The seven kind of people I want you to have in your life. You ready? Number one, people in the will of God. Let me tell you something, man. <laughs> Not around the will. People up in the will of God. See, because let me tell you something. It's important. People who are in the will of God do not bring chaos and confusion in your life. When you understand this, man, let me tell you something. People do what 1 John 3 says. We know that we know him if we keep his commandments. If a man says he knows him and doesn't keep his commandments, he's a liar. Truth ain't in him. You need people that are in the will of God that close in your life because people in the will of God can be trusted. Do you know, you, you got to stay away from the Jonah effect. Ship doing just fine to Jonah get on the ship being out the will of God and you bring in storms in my life. People who are not in the will of God bring storms you didn't even ask for. And you're trying to co-sign some of these people like, well, I'm just, you know, helping them out. I'm just doing it. Let me tell you something, man. You got, listen, the kind of people you need in your life, where you going, are people that's in the will of God. I ain't saying you can't be cool with folk that ain't there yet. I got friends, don't even go to church. I got friends, I be seeing, they be like, yo, real, I'll I'm, I'm, be there soon. They be saying that for like five years. I'm coming to see you. And we cool. We cool. I ain't tripping. But you ain't in my inner space. I don't have no time to invest like that because I need people in my life that's in the will of God because we speak the same language. If people are not in the will of God, they don't speak your language. You, you're, you're talking spiritual stuff and they're talking carnal stuff and they're like, you're crazy. What do you mean by that? What do you mean? What do you mean? That <laughs> you're, I'm fasting. You're fasting. What does that mean? You're not eating? You're not, who, who doesn't eat? 
you're being brainwashed. I could never go that long without eating meat. You see, in their mind, they don't understand spiritual things. People add value. You need people to add value. The Bible says in Proverbs 27 and verse 17, it says it very clearly. It's iron sharpens iron. You sharpen the countenance of your friend. You can't have dull blades in your life. You need people that are not draining you, but that are pouring into you. People that are challenging you. What are you reading? What are you doing? People that challenge. I need people in my life to add value. Like, because you're in my life, I feel like you enhance me. You take me to another level. Right? I always tell people, never be the smartest person in the room, man. Have people in your life that just truly add value, right? Here's a big one, integrity. Integrity is huge, right? Because in Proverbs 11 and 3, integrity of the upright will guide them, but the perversity of the unfaithful will destroy them. Proverbs 19 and 1 says, better is a poor who walks up with integrity than one who is perverse in his lips and is a fool. Hmm. Integrity, loyalty matters. See, when you have integrity, I can trust you with stuff. See, you don't think about little stuff. Little stuff. I do. See, the, the higher you go up in life, you're going to start thinking about stuff you ain't thinking about right now, but you're going to be thinking about it because integrity means everything to you. Like, you invite people to your house, you invite them. Who are you? I don't know you. They with me. Yeah, but you got invited. I don't know who they are. I don't need the feds come looking for them knocking on my door. I don't let everybody get in my car. You don't know what people got on them. You don't know what people just did. People have all kind of stuff going on. You just say, hey, come on, come here. I'll come to my house. Y'all come, come on and get in my car. All right. I don't jump in everybody's car. It's called an accessory. You be like, trying to, hey, what be? I just took a ride. Yeah, sure. Yes, brother. Yeah. Integrity, man. You want people in your life, like it's straight up and down. These people are integrity. They're not perfect, but that's a sense of integrity, man. Loyalty. That's a sense they're not going to put your life in jeopardy. In a real sense, you know what integrity does? Let me bless you. In every relationship. <laughs> I was in a relationship um, workshop a couple years back. I was in a DMV, and God dropped this revelation in my spirit, right? Here it was. Integrity in a relationship is when you give the person a choice. The moment I stop giving you a choice is the moment I stop having integrity. At least if you gave me a choice to say no <laughs> or yes, you just gonna put something on me and I gotta react to it. That ain't called integrity. Like, let, if I'm gonna be trifling with you, at least give me a choice. Then I can own that. I chose to be trifling with you. But if you just kind of trick me into something, there ain't no integrity in that. Somebody got that, right? Here's the other one. Consistent. How big is that, right? This is a big deal for a lot of folks because we often run into folks that are not consistent. Many, oftentimes because we're not consistent. It's just February and some of y'all ain't working out no more. <laughs> All up in the gym in January. <laughs> Back to fried chicken. It's February, man. Consistency, right? In Luke chapter 16, verse 13, man, nobody can serve two masters. Lest they love the one and hate the other. Right? You got to be loyal. Right? Jesus is the same. According to Hebrews 13 and 8, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So your life cannot be a revolving door. People in and out. You need some consistency in your life. I need friends who are there. I don't need friends that I be wondering, like, you're going through these seasons, like, I, I, I don't need friends taking sabbaticals from me. Where you been? Like you just run away and come back like a, like a little puppy. Like, where you been? The consistency. Because consistency matters in relationships at every level. In platonic relationships, in other kind of relationships, consistency matters. Don't start something that you don't finish. Amen. Now, here's a big one. Boy. Real and truthful. Colossians 3 and 9 says, do not lie to one another since you put off the old man with his deeds. Ephesians 4.25 says, put away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. 
essentially what that's saying is you need people in your life who will tell you at all times the truth. Now, I want to I wanna, I wanna take a little time and talk about this because this is a touchy subject for some people because we don't often tell people the truth. And the reason why some people are gun shy about telling folks the truth is because the last person who said they wanted to hear the truth couldn't handle it. So you can't have people in your life telling you the truth and then y'all fall out and you like don't want to be friends no more or you don't want to be involved. Like you, got, you need people that don't fluff you up all the time. See, my mentors, I have mentors in my life because I want them to tell me the truth. I, I'm not calling you for you to affirm me and tell me how great thou art and I'm so proud of you. I'm calling you because I need to be challenged. Tell me the truth. What areas can I grow? That's why I don't mentor everybody because, see, I use the model of mentorship from the Old Testament. Like, people ask me to mentor them all the time and I size them up, you know? And I'm thinking, like, when a father in the Old Testament would mentor his son, the first thing he would do, he would bring him in the covenant. Not mentor, but when he'd bring his son in the covenant, he would circumcise him because circumcision was a cutting. So here's the point. The spiritual point is, if your mentor can't cut you and you be okay, <laughs> You ain't ready for the truth. If somebody can't call you and literally cut you to pieces, like, what is wrong with you? Don't you ever do that again. That was stupid. Let me tell you three reasons why. And that don't run you away, then you, you ready for real relationships. But if somebody tell you the truth and you like, you go rebut, well, you just don't want me to be, and you just think, and you just, uh, and, see, you ain't ready, you ain't ready for no real relationships. You want people to acquiesce your foolishness. I need people to look me in the face and tell me the truth. You know that feeling you feel? You with your friends <coughs> all day long, you had some of your nose, been in front of all people, you get home, realize all day I had this in my nose, nobody told me. All y'all my friends. Been taking selfies and everything. Somebody should have told me I had something in my nose. <laughs> we just didn't want to tell <laughs> you. tell me that. <laughs> Y'all going to tell me when I do something stupid. Tell me when I'm wearing something stupid. Tell me when I'm looking crazy or when I do something that don't make no sense or when I'm about to do something. Somebody who's my friend, who loves me enough, I need you to tell me, reel me in and say, even if this costs me our friendship, I love you enough to tell you this. You may not speak to me for 20 years, but on the 21st year, you're going to call me and say thank you. <laughs> I need folks to love me like that. How many of you have friends in your life that absolutely will tell you the truth? All right, cool. Watch this. How many married men in here real quick? Married men. Married men. Oh, yeah. No. All right. How many men in here... Well, I'd be married one day. Oh, good. Because at 5 o'clock, I was like, well, no hands up. I was like, that is quite disturbing. <laughs> I, was, I was really concerned. Jesus, I was, Woo. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> All right, listen. Men who are married, this is just for free, okay? When your wife asks you to tell her the truth, <clears throat> you have to use wisdom. Honey, am I, am I gaining any? <laughs> Honey, do you like my hair? Listen. <laughs> just use wisdom. I don't say lying. Just use wisdom on how you relay the truth. Amen. That's for free, brothers. Y'all pay me later, right? I'm just kidding. All right. You need someone trustworthy and discreet. How interesting is this, right? That we don't have many trustworthy people. Now, the Bible says in Proverbs eleven thirteen 13 that a talebearer hmm, reveals secrets. But he who is of a faithful spirit conceals a matter. See, trust is important. Now, you need people in your life who can receive what you tell them in confidence and take it to the grave. You need people that's laying in the casket and folks still trying to get out of it. You ain't going to tell us. You're going to let them bury it. Come on. <laughs> you need people in your life like that. 
See, let me tell you what's crazy, man. But you got to know all your friends, it don't make people bad because they tell stuff. Some people just don't have an anointing to keep secrets. <laughs> I play basketball. No, real. I play real basketball. Those y'all who know, I really play basketball for real. And I go hard. And y'all see my personality on the basketball court, y'all be like, wow, bitch, you like intent. Because I, I go off, right? Because sometimes we get the guy on our team, and then you pick up, get the guy that can't play. They always like to, you know, put that guy with me like it's some kind of mission or something, mission trip. <laughs> come on, man, you know, come here with everything matching, you know, it's a hit, man. Come on, man. <laughs> for you with me. <laughs> you know, the guy, we all can play, man. It's, you know, this dude, he can't play. We just happen to have him on the team. And, you know, three or four times down, he get the ball, he shoot, ball go out of bounds, over the rim or something. About the fourth time, we come down, and my teammates pass the ball to him again to shoot. They shoot the ball over the basket. And I'm screaming. They look at me like, why? I ain't never seen a bitch get that man. I'm like, know your personnel! <laughs> he opened for a reason! The reason why I'm saying that, Lord Jesus, I can feel it right now. The reason why I'm saying that, because you got to know your personnel. You got to know that some people that are good people, but they always talking about the tea. They always, let me tell you what I, cool, I got to tell you. And you sitting up telling your stuff to them, and you wonder why your business all around town. Know your personnel. I love you, but I ain't telling you nothing. Some of you walking around, I just stop talking. They walking around. What y'all talking about? Jesus, keep me near. I ain't lying. Because <laughs> you just got to know who you're dealing with. So you just can't assume because a person is close and cool with you that that's the person you confide in. I have people I confide in. I got stuff, you know, I take to the grave. I got stuff, you know, because I'm just loyal like that. So you need people in your life who will trust you. How many of you have somebody in your life you absolutely feel like I mean, would never, under any circumstance, leak your stuff. Let me try it the other way. How many of you wish you had somebody like that? Raise your hand. Wow. All of you raise your hand the second time. Keep your mouth. <laughs> All right, here's up. You need finally a supporter and an encourager. This is big, man. Number seven is so huge, right? Because the kind of person in your life right now is a person that can, can encourage you in a world of so much negativity, in a world of so much pessimism. In Hebrews 3 and 13, exhort one another daily while it's day, lest you be hard through the deceitfulness of sin. We gather in the house of God, according to Hebrews 10, 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, we exhort one another because we see the day approaching. We're here to encourage one another. We're here to support one another. I learned many years ago, you know, when I, I was um, looking at my doctorate degree, and I was, I was, my professor said something to me that changed my life in terms of why I'm so relational. I've always been a relational person, but I didn't realize something. My professor said to me, do you realize that when you hug people sometimes, that's the only hug they get all week. So I'm very intentional about speaking to people, hugging people, giving them a word of encouragement. Because when that gathering in a place like this, you never know. We turn to people and we say, have a good day. Or, you know, I just want to say, I'm glad you're here. You don't realize that that's a ministry that some people never get all week long. Some people be told, you ain't nothing, you a dog, you ain't going to be nothing. And they come in the house of God. They don't come in the house of God to step over you. You never speak to them. And then you side eye them. They come in the house of God for somebody to tell them something positive. You need people in your life who can encourage you. You don't need Debbie Downers all the time. You need folks in your life that can push you in and get you out to bed. We're going to study. Get up. We're going to work out. Somebody will take the fried chicken out your mouth. I, 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 no. <laughs> 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 
You need encouragers. We're going to do this. We're going to make it. We're going to, we're going to Bible study. Some of y'all had friends that love you enough that brought you here. You had some other plans. They're like, we're going to Bible study. Okay. But they love you enough for you to get the word. They love you enough for you to come to church. You need people like that. Let me, let me close this way. All right? That was seven. Let's review those seven things real quick so you'll never forget. Number one was what? People who are in the will of God. Number two was what? Number three was what? Four was what? Five was what? Six was what? Seven was what? All right, let me tell you something. I, I share this and play softly in a major, major key. <laughs> um, I share this finally because I shared it um, at the other services uh, because I've lived it personally, right? Many of you know my story and know some of the trauma I've had to experience personally in relationships. Um, people ask me often, and I'm going to sum it up to you this way, Bishop, like, like when you really look at it, what is, like, how do you measure if this is the person for me? Like, if this is the person I have to spend the rest of my life with, or, like, how do I know that, right? Isn't that a real question, right? Like, if this, what is the measurement of that? What is the true test of that? Um, because I've lived this. I'm going to see how it resonates with you, all right? You know if it's the right person. If you're in the hospital, you have tubes coming in and out of your body. The doctor walks in the room <clears throat> and says to you, We've done all we can do. And in all honesty, you have about a 50-50 chance of making it. Good luck. And the doctor walks out. And the person you so in love with is sitting in that chair next to the bed. And that's the person who heard it and who now must pray you through. Do you believe that that person has the power and connection to God to pray for you and to pray you through? They don't look that fine now, do they? <laughs> that whip don't matter now, does it? That house don't matter now, does it? How fine they are don't matter now, does it? Because at the end of the day, what matters <laughs> is that it, it came down and we were walking side by side. Would you leave me in that cold room by myself and go on with somebody else? Or would you be willing to stand there and believe God that God was going to raise me up. Ultimately, whether it's a romantic relationship, whether it's a platonic relationship, whether it's your boys, your girls, at the end of the day, you find out who your real peeps are when you're in those spaces. It's when you're in a space where they lay me off, things ain't happening, who going to stay with me? Who going to be with me? Who going to be with me? That was what Jesus did when he took 12 men. <laughs> Jesus had 12. <laughs> and one betrayed him. So, you got two or three might betray you. One might deny you. If you get a real bona fide person in your life, through all their imperfections, all their craziness, thank God for it every single day. 
because what you should thank God for are the people that God has assigned to be in your life. Amen. I want to pray for relationships tonight. That's what I'm doing. I want you to stay. And I'm, I'm simply praying for relationships to be healthy and strengthened. That's, that's all I'm doing today. I'm just praying that God will strengthen your relationships. And if you desire to give your life to Jesus Christ or make a commitment to ministry, you can do that. Just after this prayer, you can meet our team down front. I'm going to be outside shaking hands, but I want to end with this prayer. And those of you watching around the world, my prayer for you is this prayer that God would give you discernment concerning your relationships. Father, thank you for helping us understand the significance of healthy relationships. Help us to move out of the shallowness of aesthetics, materialism. Help us to seek after values, integrity, truth. Father, thank you for assigning people in our lives for reasons and even seasons and even for a lifetime. And God, we're so grateful and thankful for what we have received tonight because it helps us to evaluate our own relationships and now give us a keener sense of discernment. And as we leave this place, help us to understand what your will is for our lives. And we thank you that our relationships are going to be stronger marriages are going to be stronger friendships are going to be stronger and we give you glory and praise we thank you we thank you for the real ones for the real ones and we give your name glory we give your name praise in the name of Jesus Christ we pray somebody say amen would you hug somebody before you leave and say it was good to see you tonight